Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining Analytics Stories today. I've got Mike Doctor off with me. Mike, so much. Thanks for spending some time with us today. No, no problem, Lee. Glad, glad to help out. Uh, I've seen a bunch of your videos before, and, and, and I'm really uh, glad to be asked to, to do one of these with you. So thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Really, what this is, is both of us avoiding going out and shoveling snow. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's getting a little crazy. This is probably the fifth or sixth time. So uh, hopefully uh, my my uh, young son will come over here and uh, give me a hand. But I haven't been that fortunate the last few times. <laughs> well, we'll we'll make it through just like we have before. But uh, let me introduce Mike quickly and then I'll let him uh, add a little bit in. Uh, he He's a, a guy who really likes to get his hands dirty every time I talk to him. He's just like, he wants to get in and into the details, into the data. So it's really great to have him here because he's got that different type of perspective of really what it's like to, to be down, uh, you know, sometimes into the weeds of, of what it really takes to make, make analytics work. And he's been a lead architect building data warehouses, BI platforms, and really got the architecture down. He works for a company called DataBrains, and I'll let him, you know, tell you a little bit more about them. But you know, Mike and I have been friends for years, so you know, this is a great to have this kind of a, a chat with him. We are uh, beer buddies as well, uh, and football and uh, heavy Yankee fans. So you know, we, we've got a, a good camaraderie, so I'm really happy to, uh, to do this with him, but Mike, yeah, just give us a, a couple of words and then we'll sure, jump sure. into the real fun yeah. here. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks Lee. So as Lee said, I, I, and that's one of the things that, uh, not necessarily I have struggled with, but I, I have over the years, I've been a very hands-on, uh, technical resource for the many different companies I've worked for. So I, I was an independent contractor for many years, uh, did work in the hospitality industry. I did work at Gartner up in Stanford. Uh, and then I, uh, took a VP role at data Brains, which is a Jacksonville based full service, uh, data consultancy organization. Um, I have about 15 developers that report to me that do ETL work, uh, and we're very um, strong in our Tableau development from a business intelligence perspective. Uh, but again, one of the things I've struggled with in my career is, is, is at what point do you take your hands off the keyboard? Uh, <laughs> thankfully, I still continue to, uh, to write code, build databases, and prepare data for uh, visualizations to to happen. So it's it's still a great job. I love it. And uh, Lee and I uh, do have that uh, not only a personal friendship but also a very similar uh, business background. We we love data and we love to uh, help clients uh, see their data and be able to make financial and or any kind of decisions based upon the numbers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's always the important thing. And and you're right, there is a there is a tough balance between how far down you go and, and you have to, I think in the technical world, if you're too hands off and you get too far away from it, it it's it's really hurts you because then it's hard to communicate with your team at a deeper level because you're too high up. And yeah, then sometimes no, I, your customers may not appreciate it. Exactly. That you really know what you're doing too. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that you didn't do, thankfully, was uh, explain how many years I've been doing this and I, I try and keep <laughs> that uh, to, to myself. But yeah, you're right. With the new technologies that are constantly changing, you do have to stay abreast of everything and up to date on new technologies all the time. And and as, as you hire younger um, guys and girls, right out of college, they have a different type of technology skill that I may not have had when I came out of school. So it's, it's, it's an ever, ever challenge for uh, organizations like mine to continue to be up to speed and have the resources that can do different types of jobs. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a challenge, but I think it makes the work interesting uh, as well. So speaking about customers, so I know you, you, you've had tons of experience, you know, as a, you know, being independent, working with data brains and other companies. So you've 
I'm sure seen things that have worked really well and some things that probably didn't work as you expected. And, you know, as I mentioned, Mike and I are big Yankee fans. So I want you to imagine, you know, you are the Aaron judge of analytics. So what's one small adjustment? You know, you think like hitting adjustments, what's a small adjustment that you would coach your customers on so that they can start hitting more home runs? Yeah, good, 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 solid question. So, you know, the one thing that I've learned over the years is, you know, sometimes right out of the gate, you shouldn't be swinging for the fences. Mm -hmm. And really what I mean by that is uh, starting with uh, singles and doubles is fine. And, and, and in relation to what you and I do, Lee, is, you know, smaller projects, six to eight week projects, as opposed to, you know, six month to eight month projects, uh, you, you get to understand, A, how well you can work with the vendor, or in my mm -hmm. case, the client, and you build some trust and you build a relationship with your client, and then you're able to, uh, you know, be a long-term, um, you know, you, you, you can then become long-term with, with that mm -hmm. client instead of just having a short project and then going away, then you have multiple smaller projects. And I think we've had a lot more success in doing that as everybody talks about being agile uh, in, in this day and age. Uh, I've had a lot more success uh, hitting singles and doubles, and that leads to more runs in, in the long term with our clients. We, we uh, pride ourselves on having long-term relationships, but most of the time those long-term relationships started with singles and doubles. And, and what I mean by that is smaller, um, you know, six to eight week projects, uh, getting buy-in from management and they see the value that your organization can bring. You become a trusted advisor to them mm -hmm. and then they will open up and give you longer term engagements. And then, then, then at that point you can start hitting some home runs. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, you know, being a small company, I always find in any way that doing smaller engagements are easier just from a kind of the, the administrative side to get things sure. going. But, you know, I think it's an interesting point because in, I think in analytics, there's so many unknowns, especially for when companies are starting to make a transition, maybe from how they've done it before and they're rethinking how it should work in their organization how you envision it and how you envision getting there, I think is, is pretty tough. And so if you take it in steps, like you're describing, you can say, let's do, a, and then see where it ends up and say, okay, now we know where we got after eight weeks. Let's go, let's, let's go this way. Now we thought we might go to the left, but let's go a little bit more towards the right because we, have learned something that we didn't even think about. Uh, yeah, and, no, and, and especially as you know, uh, we're we're both uh, heavily invested uh, with our Tableau understanding mm -hmm. and skills. Sure. And and as you know, the the one beauty of Tableau, and we we've experienced this at DataBrains quite a bit, is if you pick a specific area of an organization, like let's say sales and you run a small six to eight week project and you have four or five, six um, dashboards that um, get built, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden the marketing department says, hey, look, look at what has, look what sales has. Why, why, why can't we get some of that, right? right. So it, kinda, it, it becomes a domino effect and we've, we've had a lot of good experience and to use the Tableau term of land and expand, it's, it's, it, it really does work that way, especially with the Tableau technology, uh, where you get some quick wins. And then um, with inside an organization, other departments start to feel a little jealous, actually, and say, mm -hmm. you know, why, why, why can't we have some of what sales or marketing uh, or operations has? So that, that, that's been a, another great way that we've We've uh, molded our projects to to be successful in a smaller area, knowing that it's gonna it's gonna you know have that domino effect down downstream to other departments. Yeah, and and you know, so how do you so going just kind of finishing up on this question? So how do you how, can, do you have trouble convincing customers to do smaller projects? 
You know, again, great question. Um, and the answer is no, right? Because uh, we've had a lot of success, in, in my opinion, because the, the, the cost of a smaller project mm. seems to be uh, a, a very uh, beneficial thing when you're trying to sell a project, right? If, if that number uh, that they have to go to their boss or their CFO mm. with isn't mm -hmm. all that high, they right. seem to be able to get a little bit more buy-in from their executive teams. Uh, unless, of course, you're dealing with an executive level, then, then the, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's a little easier to get a, a larger deal. But if you're dealing with someone in a smaller department that has to go and get a uh, sign off on budget and stuff like that, having that smaller project with a smaller price tag seems to have been very successful for us. And which yeah, has then yeah. led to larger engagements with uh, larger uh, budgets. I think, yeah, I just think that's just good advice for everybody to, to consider whether, whether you're an agile environment or not, just the idea of, hey, let's, let's start small, let's see what it's really going to take. And do, and it, it almost, it's like, a, if you're, you're getting to an end point with that first small project, but you're also learning so much. I think there's, Correct. You know, there are people are just so focused on what's the deliverable, right? And they, you don't think about the bigger idea that, you know, we, we also have to un gain some understanding because if we're really going to grow this, there's other things that are going to be impacted beyond just the output right. of right. this. And then you know, one of the weeks. things we also like to do is in, in those smaller engagements, we're always looking to the future for what mm -hmm. data sources and what data sets exactly. that we're uh, curating in the smaller projects and how that could potentially you know, help other areas within an organization. Because there's always the KPIs that are just for sales, but there are KPIs just for marketing, but there's always a, an overlap between the two organizations. So we try and look ahead to understand how we can build uh, data that will be useful throughout the entire organization. Yeah, you definitely want to be able to to have the data ready versus hitting the brick wall and saying, boy, I wish I had thought of that before. Correct. correct. So, so I was asking you a bit about, you know, is it hard to to uh, to get people to do some change? So I want to I want to talk about change a little bit. So, as I mentioned, Mike and I have been known to sit down and have an occasional beer, uh, though it's been a while, as he as he said. So hopefully we can get back together in the warm weather, not, not under a heat lamp. Uh, now, in the meantime, uh, and actually maybe we could even do this. Imagine we're, we're going to do a joint talk at the next Tableau conference, which hopefully will also be in person. And the conference is going to be about big obstacles that we are seeing at our clients. And what you decide you want to talk about is um, how customers are held back because they can't get out of their own comfort zone. So what, what, it is, what is it that you want to talk about and why do you think this has become a problem with customers? Yeah. yeah so, so the key that you just said there, Lee, in my opinion, is that people get into a comfort zone. So uh, what we try and do as an organization is, is, as crazy as this sounds, is get them out of that comfort zone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, take some chances. Think outside the box. Uh, you've been doing certain things for however many years. You've, you know, I, I hate to use the term, but, you know, the, the job security role that some people mm -hmm. have uh, yeah. in their organizations. And, and what we try and do is push them to, again, maybe think about looking at the data a little differently as opposed to the way they ha have, have been for the, you know, two, three, sometimes I'm actually working on a client now, literally for 15 years, he's been looking at the same data and Whoa. we came in and we helped him uh, change the way he's looking <laughs> at the data and we've gotten processes down with aggregating data and changing the way he's looking at the data. So instead of it taking, you know, four or five hours, six hours to, to, to procure the data, it, it's, it's within an hour, right? So instead of taking all this data preparation time, 
Now we've got this automated solution with adding some aggregations uh, using, in, in this case, it's, it's SQL Server, and we've got him thinking completely differently. Um, it wasn't easy because- Yeah, again, so how did you do that? Someone for 15 years- uh, it's it, it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle. It's it's um, many many different uh, Zoom meetings, actually similar to what we're doing right now, and showed him uh, how to calculate things, you know, just a little bit differently, and taught him how to uh, use some um, slowly changing dimensions to understand how he could track things over time instead of recalculating numbers by day, each and every day, instead of, you know, storing mm. the data in a format that would be more scalable and more efficient. So it's been a little bit of a struggle, um, but we did get him out of that comfort zone and he's starting to understand and realize uh, that there are different ways to, as they say, skin the cat, especially in technology, you know, uh, sure. the uh, five, six, seven different ways that you might be able to do things within Tableau. It depends on what, what you, you normally do. But in, in data, that's the same thing. Just changing people's perceptions of how they're actually reviewing their data and looking at that data in a different format, a different aggregation, or even sometimes at a lower level of granularity has mm -hmm. helped us uh, get people out of their comfort zone. Do you think that some, you know, what people are facing when it comes to, especially to working with data, are they, is it is what's the concern? Is it that uh, they just don't want to bother changing because it, it's already working? Are they concerned about risk? Like, hey, I know it works, and I don't want to. I don't want to. I I don't want to change it because I think now it, it could blow up, and then I'm going to be in trouble. What? Yeah, I mean, like, it's what's on their minds? Or, or or all of the above? I think is a fair fair assessment mm -hmm. there, right? So some people are um, very concerned about presenting things to uh, maybe to executives that that might change the way they look at things. Um, it, you know, it's the old, if, if, if the wheel ain't broke, don't fix it type of mentality. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the other thing that I've seen at this one account is that, you know, KPIs meaning two different things within two different departments. So you have the same KPI uh, and it's calculated yeah. differently in accounting as it is in sales, right? So uh, trying to push them to be a little bit more, um, I guess the right word is to push his counter, you know, coworkers into making a real decision on what the calculation should be. Right. It's, it's a huge uh, risk. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, the last thing we need to do as a consulting firm is come in and have two sets of numbers, right? Because <laughs> right. That's, right. that's, that's going to show that, you know, something's not right. So we, we have, uh, we have pushed hard to uh, getting that one set of KPIs with the same calculations across the organization, uh, which in certain cases uh, is never the case because mm -hmm. counting likes to look at things differently. Um, Whereas sales looks at something completely different that may benefit the bottom line. So, and where accounting is really looking to understand what the real number is. So you have to try and align the organizations uh, and again, get yep. people out of their comfort zone to push on them to, to make decisions that for years they haven't been able to make. So yeah, that, that's, that's the, the one thing, thing that we, we try hard to do. Yeah. Making decisions is a tough thing, but I bet the CEO, or doesn't want to see two numbers. So no, no, no question. <laughs> so in that case, going back to the thing we were talking about first about taking things in small chunks, is there something that you found you're able to do in in kind of moving people out of their comfort zone in general that you do in small pieces? Like how do you that you know? Can you describe anything in particular? Yeah. So and again, uh, I'll, I'll continue to use this client, uh, and I and I won't say their their name because that wouldn't be fair. But it's 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 a client that's a very large organization. Um, what we did in the in that case was we actually got accounting and we got sales on the same call and kind of push them to finally come up with what the final calculation should be. The, the business or the client, our client um, who we were dealing with at the project level 
didn't really want to do that over the last couple of years. And we, we finally were able to get both parties in the room meeting accounting and sales mm-hmm. and explain to them the issue. And, and, and in reality, people understand that you can't have two sets of numbers. Uh, so there is some concessions that need to take place. Um, and we, we, we put them on a Zoom. Uh, as, as you know, everything is Zoom these days. Normally, we would do this in a conference room, but uh, we did it on a Zoom and we were able to get uh, buy-in from both organizations or both you know departments mm-hmm, mm-hmm. To, to agree on what the, the actual calculation should be. So they're a real retail organization and had to do with sales and the way they were you know calculating prices and does back ordered include should be it included in the number or not included and we we, we had a good long uh, d- discussion about it and we we finally, uh, we're able to come to a conclusion and that 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 uh, now we have one number which is mm-hmm. exactly what we want yeah and so it seems like just that that um not relying just on the data and pushing it and, and having people talk through you uncovered even more stuff and that, like you said what elements had to go in and and maybe there were pieces from you know from from both sides so uh, kind of well, actually that kind of leads to, to the the third part about you know you know which direction do we go right you kind of have two team you know two two groups trying to figure out which direction so i had this this you know f- another baseball thing i wanted to bring up so you know yogi berra you know i know you know yogi he was one of the most famous baseball players uh and he and he had these funny sayings and one of them was when you come to a fork in the road, take it. And you have to stop a lot of times, you know, think about that one, right? It's like, so imagine you're walking down the road and you come to a fork and one sign, one part of the sign directs you to the path of pain. The other one takes you to the path of success. What does it say on each sign? does it say on each side good question and uh, as as yankee fans we know yogi had a lot of yogiisms so um good good question so obviously um you do come to a road whether it be in your life or in your business life as well right so personally or or, or from a business perspective I, I i would assume one of those the pain side i would think would have to say proceed with caution so um, ultimately, if you went down that fork that said proceed with caution, you, you would hope at some point that that was going to lead to the, uh, the success side as well, right? Because mm-hmm. everything can't be that easy in life and you're, you're always going to have some kind of pain, again, whether it's personal or, or uh, you know, in your business life. So um, you have to take some chances. You have to go down both forks sometimes uh, and, and, uh, and hopefully uh, you always end up on that, uh, on that success side, right? Because that's, that's where we all want to um, ultimately be is on, on that side of, of, uh, of the good part of the fork, but everybody goes down both sides. And, and what's happened with me over the years is that I've, I've always listened to my instincts. And I think when you listen to your instincts, um, you ultimately uh, will make the right decision and, and the right choice, mm-hmm. whether it, again, I, I keep ref- going back to personally as well as business, because there are a lot of parallels in what you do in your day-to-day life and in your business life. So I think the, the, the one side, the, the, the pain side would say, proceed with caution, learn from your mistakes. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the, 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 the other side is, is again, listen to your instincts. And uh, th- that, that has always uh, driven me to ultimately uh, the success that I've had, whether it be when I was an independent contractor or the success that DataBrains is having right now. We've, we listen to our instincts and we, we make decisions that we hope are the right decisions for our clients. Sometimes they're not. I mean, again, you always hit some sure. kind of speed bump. Uh, but yeah, proceed with caution. And uh, no, listen sure. to your instincts. Those would I, be my I like, two. I like that one because I especially like the trust your instincts because it's actually it's kind of um, it's a bit ironic 
given how much emphasis we put on following the data, right? In our, in, in our lives, right? You, you and I live that yep. idea. And I think it could be a trap where people get so focused on, oh, it's always got to be the data. It's always got to be the data. It's not always the data, right? Um, you, you do have to use your brain. Yep. You have to use your your gut. You have to use your experience. It's, it's a mix. And I think people can go too far and only think about the data and not mix, you know, as mix in those other elements. Sure. And, 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 so, and you know, it's, it's risky. Yeah, for sorry that. to interrupt. Yeah, go ahead. I was say people, I think, can they can they can point to the data because they're like well the data doesn't lie right and so if they start putting in their own experiences and and other factors that are uh, less tangible that's when people might start to feel especially if you're you don't have a lot of business experience if you're right, right uh, you it's it's easier to fall back on that say oh well that's what the data said if something goes wrong right because people. Nobody wants to feel like they did something wrong. Correct, and and it's. Uh, I think I forget exactly where I uh, where I was learned this, but you know, it's most clients of ours make decisions based upon their gut. Our goal is to make them make decisions based upon the data. The difference mm-hmm. being, though, once you, like you said, once you, it's not always the data, right? Because you can't make decisions solely on the data. You do have to have some understanding or instinctual decisions based upon previous experiences with the data. So going from the gut decision versus the data decision, but you also just can't make a blanket decision, I think, on the data because there are other mm-hmm. factors. And that's the beauty of what data will do is you may go into a uh, process having two or three questions, and sometimes you look at the data and you come up with three or four more questions right. that you never thought you'd have, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's always, it, it, there's always the good opportunity to, to, to have those reveals because things are hidden. And, you know, as humans, we can't think of everything. It's hard to process a lot of stuff just in your head, or if it's a new, something new that's happening that you haven't ever experienced before, how would you add that into the mix? Right. So you have to be open. You have to keep an open mind. Sure. Seeing new things and not, you know, it's hard to be unbiased, right? Cause you're like, well, I know how this works, but you may, but you might also not, you know, know about something else that you, you, you haven't come across before and you have to be able to, I think that, I think the data and the visuals, especially when you can show yeah. it visually and make really make it stand out is, is super helpful for people uh, who are willing at least to, to recognize that. Correct. Correct. Uh, that's a good point. And, and, you know, back to your initial question of the fork, you know, I think everybody, uh, tends to have some times in their, in, in their careers where they end up going left, which I guess, you know, that's the proceed with caution area. You just hope that what you learn from going left ultimately brings you back to the right side, right? Mm-hmm. And whether it be instinctual, whether it be the data, uh, hopefully everybody wants to do the right thing. And, and, uh, but you do have to go to the left many times to, to ultimately get to the right. I, that's something that I've always learned. Yeah. If you're, if you're not learning and running into some failures, even though people think failure is only a bad thing, failure can be a good thing because, Absolutely. You know, and, and the faster Absolutely. you can do it, right? That's the, you know, that idea. No, no, I would fast. agree. And especially, especially with my staff and, 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 you know, you have to explain to them that, you know, there's not all of our projects are going to be easy, right? You're right. going to run into those projects that are going to uh, be painful and uh, are, are going to uh, hopefully lead to success long-term. Um, but you do have to kind of like pay your dues by going to the left I keep using the left as the example, but you, you understand yeah. what I mean, right? 
that that painful side of the fork uh, ultimately will get you back to the right side. Yeah, I think those actually make you stronger in the end, right? Especially yeah. the client, it makes the client stronger too because they realize ultimately you can you can fail and and correct it, um, and maybe even correct it faster with with the data than than you ever could have before. So correct. Uh, it's right. a it's yeah. a learning thing. So yeah, I, I like I like that idea of you know do small pro, you know just to kind of summarize. I think all the pieces you you mentioned have this uh, flavor of you know take things small. Don't always just try to take a big project. I think that's actually important for people whose responsibilities are on maybe on the client side or even on the consulting side to scope a project. Because the tendency is to try to scope a big project, so moving down to a smaller scale uh, might not be, you know, as natural for people. But using that as a way to to learn to apply their own instincts into the mix as they go through those, because you can sure. you can react faster, I think, and uh, use those as learning experiences to to get to that next phase and get to that success you know, side of things, uh, even faster than if you, uh, did it the old way. And I think that's the key is that you can actually get to the end point faster by going in smaller chunks than trying to tackle this big thing. Uh, so I don't know if you have a couple, any words that you want to say to kind of close out as well. Cause that's, no, no, I think, uh, again, experience is a big part of how you make your, uh, instinctual decisions through life. Um, and, and I, I like to play the role of mentor with a lot of the mm. uh, younger developers that I have on my team. I, I try and coach them and try and un help them understand that, you know, it takes time to get to a point where most of your projects are successful. It's not easy. You're going to have failures like we talked about. Um, and, and I continue to drive that uh, home with, with the people that report to me. So it's it's something that I've learned over the years from some of my mentors uh, about um, you know thinking and having situational awareness based upon the project and making sure that you're doing what's right for the current situation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people don't think that way, and I think uh, mm -hmm. it's very important to understand your surroundings. Each project is different. Uh, consulting uh, throws you a lot of different curveballs. You have many different personalities, uh, many different types of data. Uh, that's that's one of the main reasons why I've, I've uh, I love the business that I'm in because you get such a wide yeah. variety of uh, data to work with, a wide variety of personalities to work with, and uh, yeah, it's. Amen uh, to that. <laughs> makes the job that much more interesting. As you know, I mean, you, we're in the same industry. So you have clients, multitude of clients. Day one could be client A and client C, and day two could be client A and client B. And that, that, that's, yeah. that's the beauty of what we do. Yeah. Make, keeping, it, keeping it interesting by having it mixing up the kinds of work, mixing up the kinds of people you work with, kinds of companies. Sure. That's why, you know, certainly love it on, on my side, Mike, this was great. Thanks so much. Uh, I, I took away a couple of uh, a key things that I'm going to keep in mind for myself and, and, and keep pushing my clients to, to, to think yeah. about these kinds of things. So appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, time. thank you. Thank you yeah. for the opportunity. Yeah. Appreciate it. It was Everybody, uh, I'm glad we did this. Uh, Hopefully next time uh, we, we we could maybe have some kind of IPA on our hand or yeah I would uh, we'll it's a virtual out. a virtual toast so yeah I I I, I give you that and you everybody thanks for joining us uh, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and we'll see you soon on Analytic Stories thanks Lee bye Mike.